Well, hey, thank you for joining me on Wednesday night. Uh, it's not Wednesday for me. I film on Tuesdays. So as we speak, if you're watching this, uh, we're probably having a deacons meeting right now, talking about phase two of opening the church. That information will come. I'm sure things, I don't know, now that we've got people in the church that have COVID-19, exactly what we're going to do. So with all that said, and um, I'll be giving you an update probably Thursday. Uh, if there's something to update, and we'll see what all we got going on with phase two starting back Wednesday night church. All right, tonight, or today, we're going to be in Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, I want us to look at some guys. The King James says their hearts were ablazed within them. I, I got my tea today. I told you I'm trying to do my tea kick. Let me tell you about mine. I don't get paid for this, by the way. If I did, I'd show the product. But since nobody's paying me, I'm not showing the product. But um, this tea is called Linden Tea. Uh, Linden Tea, probably one of my favorites. Hard to find. Found out about Linden Tea because basically I had heard and read that if you had a cold, or bad allergies or something. If you steep some linden tea, uh, it would take care of it. Well, here's what it does. If you buy linden tea and you got a bad cold, flu, anything like that, you just feel really bad, or allergies even. If you steep you some linden tea and you put it, uh, drink a cup of it, it is amazing how fast everything clears up for about 10 minutes and then it all comes flooding back that's what it does to me but for about 10 minutes i feel better uh i don't know but i like the taste of it just fine this is just straight linden tea now this coffee cup i kind of have a little collection of cups this is one of my favorites because i can get my whole hand into the mug that's that's something that drives me crazy is using two fingers to hold up a coffee cup. I like a bigger mug with a big handle that I can fit in there. And not one with a little twisty thing where I'm holding it like this. I don't want to hold it like that. I want to get my hand in it and I want to hold it. You'll notice it said old guy's rule. A hateful old woman gave me this mug for my 40th birthday. Uh, my mother. And, uh, but actually, I, I love the handle of it. So, and um, for those of you that care, y'all, like I said, people have been asking me about my mugs. And I don't know, I'm just trying to be more laid back on our Wednesday night Bible study here online and uh, learn something about the Bible. But at the same time, you know, whenever I take a drink of something or I do something, people are like, what is that you're drinking? And, or what is that in the background, you know? Somebody asked me about this picture back here and stuff like that. So I don't mind telling you all about it and giving you information. All right. Luke chapter 24, where we're at, verse 13 through 32. But I'm going to start with verse 32. It says, So they said to each other, Weren't our hearts ablaze within us? while he was talking with us on the road and explaining scripture to us. So they're recounting something that just happened to them. What made these men's hearts set on fire? Um, they were talking to Jesus, but more than that, it was when he opened up the scripture, when he opened up the Bible, and started explaining it to them. When I say open, I don't mean he he broke out a scroll and rolled it out and said, look here. I mean, he opened up what it means. He, he taught them. He explained. He, he did some expository teaching from the text. He exegeted the passage, whatever you want to say. Um, what we tend to do to get fire back in people in church, 
and I know because I've been in big churches, I've been in little churches, uh, I've been in a number of places serving on staff, uh, three as pastor, I've had every position you can have. A lot of times things will start to wane a little bit in the church. And so we get these ideas, we got to have revival meetings, or we've got to have camp meetings, or Bible conferences, or um, a rally. We have a youth rally, or singles rallies, or we do all these things. And there's all these things we come up with. The reason those things first were created was because people already had a fire within them and wanted more. And so originally these things were put in place in our churches by our pastors mostly so that people had an outlet for learning, growing, developing because they already had the passion. The problem has become, uh, in my opinion, uh, this is just Wayne, a lot of folks have started thinking that's what brought the fire. That's what got people excited. None of these compare to, none of these things create. They don't create the passion. Kids come back from, from camp and they're on fire and it lasts about a week. You know, if you're not on fire when you go, it's not going to be as impactful and long lasting. Like I said, we started doing those things because these were not scheduled events to create passion in Christians. These were things because people were passionate about Jesus and we were giving them an outlet. A lot of people have experienced, I know I have, I've had that fire within me. Um, if you truly encounter Jesus, you're going to have that burning passion within you at salvation, uh, coming to know him, uh, any experience you've had. But the fact is that things that ignite this fire are things that typically the world, my own sin, things like that kind of take the passion out of me. One of the biggest things that took my passion, my fire out of me when I first came to Christ, frankly, was other Christians. The water brigade, they call them. If you're on fire, they'll put it out. Uh, people saying things to me, telling me stuff, had a pastor that shared more than he should have with me early on, and it just was too much of a burden, and I, I really lost my passion early on. Didn't change the experience I had, but that experience I had wasn't something I could live on. I couldn't keep on in that. It's called burnout. It happens. Uh, just about every pastor friend of mine has experienced it. If you're in the church and you're serving, you serve in this ministry and that ministry and you teach this and you do that and you're on this committee and that committee and you're just overrun, you will get burned out just like everybody else. So it's a reality of things that happen in the church. I think the last numbers I saw, 20% of the people were doing 80% of the work. Those 20% get burned out. And they're working, and they're doing, and they're doing, and they're working. But when you've got a fire within you before you get burned out, there's going to be a desire in you. It's going to be a desire to connect to the scriptures, to the Bible. I seriously doubt somebody's passion and desire if all they put is influ their their how they're being influenced by others, how they're experiencing Christianity, how they're experiencing life, if they put that over the scriptures, your experiences do not trump the Bible. If you have an experience or a feeling or a warm fuzzy or you just think you're right, but the Bible contradicts that, you're wrong. You need to adjust. You, you may have heartburn but you don't have the Holy Spirit. You got to understand in the context of scripture what it is that God would have you to do. That's one of our issues. Um, we want to take, in Christianity, the majority seems to think that I experience this or I feel this, so this is the way it is between me and God. And the truth is, 
if it does not line up with the Bible, then you're wrong, period. So you're, if you don't have a desire for the Bible, I seriously doubt your passion and you won't last. You're not going to make it. What sustains you is the Bible. What keeps you are the scriptures. Um, you'll have a desire for the scripture. You'll have a desire to commune with the Savior. You'll have that within you. Let's see. You know, one of the big questions is, is your fire still burning? Or do you still have that? Or did you burn out a long time ago? Have you just been going through the motions? Have you been faking it? I mean, I don't know. That's between you and God. But I know I've been there. I've burned out. Church before last, I burned out. I was out of the ministry for a year. And I was the first two months, I was glad. But after that, first two months was over with, I was the most miserable human being in the world and hard to live with because I was out of the ministry. I was not pastoring. I wasn't doing. I never quit going to church. I never quit taking my family. Never quit doing devotions. Never quit praying, studying, doing all that stuff. But I wasn't serving in what I was called to do. And it almost killed me. It was awful. I wanted to just not exist. Let me give you the background. This event happened on the very day Jesus rose from the grave. There's a great deal of uncertainty and confusion that's going on with the disciples. All Everybody is, you know, so many of them didn't understand. He told them he had to die. He told them all this stuff, but they just didn't get it. Let's back up to verse 13. It's two men walking down the road to Emmaus. Now the same day two of them were on their way to the village called Emmaus and was about seven miles from Jerusalem. Together they were discussing everything that had taken place. And while they were discussing and arguing, because that's what we do huh, a lot of times, especially on social media, that seems to be the place. If you join a, a group on social media, a Christian group, and you go, this would be edifying. I'll learn something. I'll grow. Maybe somebody will post some really good articles or we can talk about this text. What it usually ends up being is a bunch of arguing. So they were discussing and arguing. Jesus himself came near and began to walk along with them. But they were prevented from recognizing him. So we also do this. They're trying to find answers. They're really perplexed. Jesus has died on the cross. It's been three days. They're trying to find answers. Here's the key, though, the part that's that really neat. The answer's right there with them. Isn't that wild? I mean, Jesus is walking along with them while they're trying to figure out about Jesus. So, at this point, Jesus enters the conversation. Look at verse 17. I'm going to read through to 21. Then he asked them, this is Jesus speaking, what is this dispute? See, because they, they were arguing. What is this dispute you're having with each other as you are walking? And they stopped walking and looked discouraged. And then one of them answered him, Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know? Who doesn't know the things that happened there in these days? Jesus said, What things? Like he didn't know. So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, powerful in action, and speech before God and all people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. Verse 21. But we were hoping that he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. Besides all this, it's the third day since these things happened. So they had heard the prophecies. They had heard from eyewitnesses already. Uh, verse 22 tells us, Moreover, some women from the group astounded us. So they've already 
heard some witness about Jesus being resurrected, the women, they arrived early at the tomb, and when they didn't find his body, they came and reported that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Still hadn't dawned on them. They, they have eyewitnesses, people they trust, they love. They're Jesus' followers. Said they saw angels and said that he's alive. And they're, they're arguing about whether or not he is, basically. And he's with them, asking them these questions. And they're like, are you the only person, <laughs> are you the only person in the world that doesn't know what happened? So... They were talking with Jesus, and they didn't even know it. I mean, he's right there in their presence. Now, if we're honest, we can identify with these men a lot of times in our lives. Can we not? Um, a majority of the time in our own lives, we're just like this. There will be a desire to connect with the Scriptures if you have a legitimate passion within you for Jesus. You're not going to be passionate for Jesus and deny the Scriptures. You're just not. Verse 32. So they said to each other, this is the one we started with. Weren't our hearts ablaze within us while he was walking with us on the road explaining the scriptures to us? So the burning within these men came when Jesus had explained the scriptures. Um, I remember early on in ministry. Well, let me say my Christian life. I had a pastor who was, he was a lot of passion. He was fiery. A lot of you would just love to sit under his preaching. He was, he's, he's not anymore a preacher, but back then he would hack and run and holler. And he was, I loved it. Loved every second of it. Until I started to mature. And when I started to mature, I started digging in the scriptures, listening to teachings, and realized I wasn't being taught by my pastor. Within a year of sitting under the same sermon, different text every week, I was starting to die spiritually. I just drying up inside. Because you could only hear about salvation messages and the rapture of the church so many times, you know. And that's all, that was what he had. He was a one-trick pony, and he didn't last long because he didn't know how to study and prepare and look into Scripture. And then we got a new pastor, and, you, you know, after some time, he came in, and he did this thing where he was teaching. He had passion, he had power, but not, not like the other one had. And he would teach the scriptures, and he would teach the Bible to me. And it set me on fire. He was an expository preacher going through the text, verse by verse. What I understood later was the first pastor was all thunder and no lightning. If I've got to choose between the two, I want the lightning. Now, it's ideal if you can be both and be legit and be real with it because there are some times that the passion needs to show. You don't need to be dead and boring while you're preaching and teaching these wonderful passages because there's so much wonderful, powerful stuff there. How can you not have a passion for it? But at the same time, you can't just put on a show it can't be cotton candy. You got to have steak and potatoes. You got to have your vegetables. But when when this pastor started teaching the Bible, I said to myself, "Then that's the way I'm going to be." I could do the hacking. I could do the stuff. I know how to do it. But I'm just not going to. Now the passion within me is going to come from the text. For you, if if somebody were to come up and if I if I let somebody come preach and I say I'm sick one week and he comes in and he's just all show, all thunder, no lightning, would you know it? Would you know the difference? Can you not tell 
when somebody is not actually proclaiming God's word? Or do we go, well, I like that kind of preach. That was anointed. I've sat in services and listened to preaching and hear people say, boy, that was anointed. But he didn't teach anything. He didn't preach anything. You didn't learn anything. So what's the point? Do you want to be entertained or, you don't want, or do you want to grow? These people, they said, were our hearts ablaze within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? If you, if somebody is explaining the Bible to you and that doesn't excite you and fire you up, you're the problem. You need to look within you. you if you don't have a passion for God's word, if God's word is being broken down to you and you, it means nothing to you, you need to check yourself. You need to make sure you're right with God. Because those who love Jesus, they are going to have an emphasis on having personal time in God's Word and growing in God's Word. And they're going to want to be taught God's Word. And they're going to want to mature. And they're going to want to develop. They're going to want to know the weird stuff in the Bible. They're going to want to know the things that other people are uncomfortable with. Because we want to develop. If you just stay the same, you're not growing. you got to get off the milk and get on the meat. Are you a student of God's word? Don't tell me you got a passion for God when you don't care about the word of God. Doesn't work that way. Were not our hearts ablaze within us while he was explaining the scriptures to us? We'll look at this more next time. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the passion that these man these men had as Jesus taught them the Bible. For us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.